Well, welcome again. In case you were late coming in, both here or maybe you're at home and uh, weren't uh, able to see the beginning of our service, just want to remind you that the sermon today will be dealing with some sensitive topics, and uh, nothing in there is explicit in any way, but just sensitive topics, and if you know, there are little ears listening, and we'll make sure parents are aware of that, in case there's uh, some that may want to say, hey, I'm not really sure I'm going to ready for my children here, homosexuality and transgenderism and things like that. So we are uh, now in our third week of a series we began through the season of Lent entitled, Standing in a Falling World, where we've recognized that as believers, the world around us is changing, and changing rather rapidly. And the pace of that change seems at times to be quickening. And many of the changes that our culture is making and some of its trajectories are disturbing and challenging to us in our faith and as Christians. And so we've been each week looking at different ways in which our culture has been moving and what do we stand for as Christians and how. We began by looking at the topic of truth, that we as Christians stand for the truth as given to us in the Scriptures, particularly the truth of the gospel. Last week we looked into the topic of beauty and that we as Christians stand for the beauty of the soul, which is given beauty through the presence of the Holy Spirit conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Today we'll be looking at something quite related to the first sermon, but a little bit different. So I invite you to stand. We're reading from the Gospel of John chapter 1. So I stand in honor of the God's Word and its reading. Just the first verse. In the beginning was the Word was the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Though the grass withers and the flower fades, the Word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated, and we pray once again. Heavenly Father, with gratefulness to You, Holy Spirit, that You have inspired Your servants to give us these Your words to us. We pray as we sit under its teachings that we would, because of the presence of Your Spirit with us, be comforted because we need to be comforted. we challenged in our sin and confronted because we desire to be changed into the image and likeness of Jesus, which we cannot do of ourselves. But in you, all things are possible. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, we will be together exploring what does it mean to stand in a falling world for words. Standing for words. Because in our culture today, it's kind of weird to say, words are under assault. <laughs> Language is being challenged and changed. And when you can change the definitions of words, you can alter reality for people. And I want to explore that with you a little bit before we talk about what are we going to be talking about specifically. In 1871, there was a book that was published entitled Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There by Lewis Carroll, what we call Alice in Wonderland. And in that novel, there is a conversation between the character Alice and Humpty Dumpty and, you know, sits on the wall. And Humpty Dumpty has something interesting to say about words. He says, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, nothing more, nothing less. And Alice responds by saying, well, the question is, Humpty Dumpty, whether you can make words mean so many different things. And Humpty Dumpty's response is, wrong question, Alice. The question is, which is to be master? Are we to be mastered by words? Or are we to master them? Are we the ones that determine what things mean? Or do meanings impress themselves upon us? Because when we can change the definitions of words, we change the definitions of realities for people. And people know this. There's a famous quote by Mao Zedong, the communist dictator, who said, you fools, oh wait, sorry, we will conquer the world because you fools think that words are labels that are properly or improperly pasted onto things. We know that words are little dynamite sticks in people's minds, and we hold the fuse. And so today we want to be exploring the nature of words, recognizing where words are being challenged, changed, definitions moved, the effects that it has on culture, 
and what we should be standing for in the truth as Christians. Because Jesus says in the Gospel of John chapter 17 that these words, sanctify them by the truth, set them apart. Your word is truth. If we are to go to a place where we know truth is to be found, it is within the word of God, rightly handled. And he goes on to say, as you sent me into the world, Father, I have sent them into the world. We don't have the luxury of not being in the world. And we are not only don't have the luxury of not, we are sent into the world by Jesus to be the bearer of truth in a culture that is changing the nature of reality by redefining words. And so we are going to look at three words today, very important ones. One is the word marriage, second is the word gender, and thirdly the word person. Marriage, gender, and person. And if you can change the definition of these things, you alter the nature of society. The first is marriage. Marriage has been defined in the Scriptures beginning in the opening chapters of Genesis, reaffirmed by Jesus through the Gospels and picked up as well by the Apostle Paul in the epistles. I'll quote in this case from Matthew 19, where Jesus is pulling from Genesis to make his definition clear about what marriage is. He says, at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What do we see here in the biblical definition of marriage? Marriage is defined as the union between a man and a woman. It is also defined in a way that a man, and as well as a woman as well, will leave their families of which they grew up in to form a new family. And that God has designed that these families, composed of the union of a man and a woman, will bring forth children and that children will be brought up within this environment of a mother and father within the context of a family. This is one of the bedrock institutions of our society. However, the word marriage is under assault. In 2015, there was a Supreme Court decision called the Marriage Equality Act that redefined marriage. In giving the majority opinion, Justice Kennedy said this, no union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. Sounds nice, doesn't it? Where's the twist? Two people. No longer is the definition of marriage understood between to be a man and a woman. It is now understood to be between two people. That could be between two men or two women. Now, one person that noticed exactly what was happening was Supreme Court Justice Roberts. So when he, giving his opinion in response to this ruling of the Supreme Court, Justice Roberts said this, every definition that I looked up prior to about a dozen years ago defined marriage as a unity between a man and a woman, as a husband and a wife. You are not seeking to join the institution you're seeking to change what the institution is. And let's make no mistake, that's exactly what is happening. When you, and they say, no, 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 no. We're not seeking to do that. We're just expanding the definition by including others that were heretofore not included. We're being inclusive with our definition. But Justice Roberts is correct. By expanding the definition, you have changed it fundamentally. And we as Christians not only believe that it's been changed fundamentally, it has gone against the design by Almighty God, who from the beginning created the male and female, and said that we'll leave their father and mother, be joined as husband and wife in a nuclear family. So we as Christians are to stand in the midst of this change and say, no, there is marriage instituted by God, but that marriage is between a man and a woman. And this church will remain solid and understanding marriage as defined that way, regardless of what our culture says or does. And depending on what time, what happens, that may come with a cost. And if it comes with a cost, then we should be willing to pay it. The God, you know, Romans chapter 8 says that you are children of God. You're children of God. And as children, you are heirs of God fellow heirs of Christ, 
provided what? You suffer with him in order that you may be glorified. And Christians need to be ready to suffer in the culture as it is shifting and changing. And we'll see that increasingly as we go. So marriage is one word that is being redefined by our culture. Another one, and this is probably the most current in terms of, and probably some of the most complicated uh, in terms of getting our minds and around what's happening is the idea of gender. This is very much alive right now. Um, Mr. Potato Head aside. <laughs> gender. How do we understand gender? Well, we want to start in the Scriptures by looking in the book of Genesis about how God made men and women, as he says there in Genesis 5 in this case, when God created mankind, he made them in his image and likeness. He made them male and female and blessed them and named them mankind. So we see here that God has created a, a binary understanding of man and woman. Now, as we enter into the conversation of gender, we need to realize that our culture, and this is not necessarily wrong, has made a distinction between sex and gender. Sex and gender. Now, sex or just would be defined this way. This is from just the dictionary. Sex refers to the state of being male or female, distinguished on the basis of reproductive organs and structures. This is, you'll use the language assigned at birth. You are born male or female. That's your sex. That's your biological sex assigned at birth. Now, before we move much beyond that, we should be aware as Christians that there is, and this is, we should, I think, give credence to this, a third category, about one in every, well, be careful how to use the word category, but about one in every 5,000 births uh, is what they would refer to as intersex or middle sex. There are four categories of that. That is where people are born with chromosomes that don't match their presenting biological organs. Uh, so you would have a XX is obviously the female chromosomes. So you have someone that could be born with XX chromosomes that present with male genitalia, or you can have XY and opposite. This is a category. It's pretty small, about one about every 5,000. This is very, very difficult for families and for children as they're raised in these environments. Families, parents need to make decisions from an early age, how, what they want to do in some of these cases. Um, there, there's hormone therapies to help bring along the... the, the the decision of the parents in terms of the child to have that match up. This is, a, this is hard, and we as Christians should be aware of this. Uh, a lot of mercy and grace around these situations. This is, the, I would say, the, the effects of the fall. Sometimes the effects of the fall physically have these sort of things, and we should be aware of that. But uh, when we are aware of that, intersex does not eliminate the basic categories as created by God. Uh, Christopher Yuan, who's a professor at Moody, who's also... Uh, himself is a celibate man who uh, has same-sex attraction, says this, intersectionality, intersexuality is a biological phenomenon. We should be aware of that as Christians. Where an individual may have gen uh, genital ambiguity or genetic variance. In human biology, however, anomalies do not nullify categories nor abolish binaries. We need to understand that God has made man and woman as gender assignment, as sexual assignments biologically at birth, recognizing we need to be careful about one in every 5,000, we need to show a lot of grace. What I want to talk about today, though, is particularly those that have chromosomes that match their assigned sex at birth and some of what's happening to redefine gender around that. Gender is, is separate from sex. So sex is the biological assignment at birth. Gender is the embodiment of that sex in culture. And we need to understand the difference between gender and sex. If we don't understand that distinction, we're going to get lost real fast. So just to show you just the definition of that, Joe Carter from the Gospel Coalition, I don't think anybody would disagree with this on the secular side as well. Gender refers to biological difference in male and female embodiment and the different cultural ways in which distinctions between male and female are manifested. Let me give you an example. I don't generally fit the cultural embodiment of a male in the upper Midwest in Michigan. What I mean by that is I'm not a hunter. Okay, I don't hunt. Um, I don't watch football. This is March, so apparently there's something called March Madness. I don't know what that is. I don't really even care to find out. Uh, I, I don't own a gun. I don't have concealed and carry, nor do I wish to. I read Shakespeare, I like listening to opera, okay? So in that sense, I'm not really, you know, culturally speaking, 
So there is a gender embodiment within culture. If we were in uh, uh, Scotland at a particular time, men would wear kilts. I'm not walking around with a kilt, okay? There's this, there's this certain thing. Now, what we're talking about today is when we need to recognize that there is that. And the same thing for femininity as well. What we're talking about is the desire to erase my gender and present otherwise than what I was assigned at birth. That's something different. Maybe I don't quite fit the categories of the upper Midwest in terms of a man. But there's a difference between saying that and saying I'm going to erase my gender by ceasing to identify as male and presenting myself as female. That's something else. We are on board with that? As well as we, so there's that issue. There's also the issue of the expansion of the categories of gender to include all sorts of other things. To give you just a, a flavor of that, this is from a professor at Brown University. He says, the belief that there are only two genders is an oversimplification. A person's gender identity may be masculine, it may be feminine, it may be a combination of both, it could be neither, or it could shift over time. This is the phenomena where I could present one day as a male, and then the next day I can present as female. The next day I can present as neither. And when I present as neither, um, gender fluidity, if you heard these kind of languages, the language used, uh, I can, and as well as all the pronouns that go with it, so you can, today I want you to refer to me as he, uh, tomorrow I want you to refer to me as she, the next day I want you to refer to me as they. Because if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't identify as either male or female, then there's uh, pronouns that are third person pronouns that then are applied to the individual. And so this is what's, you know, kind of out there and about, and there are some ed environments and some educational environments. I heard about a situation where every day a teacher will ask you, today, how should I address you today? And every student in the class must say, today I am he, or to, and then they could change. Tomorrow it could be something else. Now, in the act of doing this, they are redefining gender. That's what we're talking about, is redefining words and standing for the meanings of words. They're redefining them. Again, back to Christopher Yuan, the modern redefinition of gender refers to a psychological reality independent from biological sex. Remember, sex versus gender. Our culture now values altering the objective physical reality of our bodies to accommodate the subjective impression of ourselves. So biblically, we believe that, yes, there is sex and gender, but we live in a way where our sex and our gender are united. I'm not seeking to erase my masculinity and present as feminine, and the same thing for a woman. A woman would not seek to biblically erase her femininity, femininity, femininity uh, to be feminine, and then to present as male. And certainly not something we're denying either and saying, they, but that's what our culture is saying. The culture is saying we can decide for ourselves. Bioethicist Alice Drager says it just explicitly. Look, nature doesn't tell us what counts for male and who counts as female. We draw those lines. We decide. And if I want to decide differently, nature, God, doesn't tell me. I decide for myself. This is on down the line. I don't, God doesn't tell me what marriage is. We define what marriage is. God doesn't tell me what gender is. I define what gender is. And this is not absent from the Scriptures. The book of Deuteronomy says that a man should not present it as a woman, and a woman should not present it as a man. We also see this in the epistles of Paul, 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is a kind of an interesting passage, difficult to trans uh, understand at times. It's, it's the passage of Scripture where Paul's talking about head coverings. By the way, every woman in here is sinning. <laughs> just kidding. Not that there's anything wrong. I, I see some scowls. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> women can wear head coverings and hats. It's all fine. But I don't think that what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians 11 is women make sure you wear hats. What is Paul getting at when he's talking about head coverings? I would suggest that what he's talking about is gender, and that in the Corinthian church, within the Greco-Roman culture, men were presenting themselves as women in relationship to hair, which is what Paul describes as the covering. So to show you from that from verses 14 and 15, does not the very nature of things, remember the Alice Drager a second ago, nature's not going to tell us, what, but according to the nature of things, doesn't that teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him? 
but that if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. For long hair is given to her as a what? A covering. What is Paul talking about? Hair. Why is Paul talking about hair? Because of a Greco-Roman gender issue. Remember, gender is culturally specific. And so within the Greco-Roman culture, hair for men had a certain kind of understanding. I want to show you that from the first century. This is a philosopher from the first century. Long hair is not fit for men. Philo, who's, uh, who's from Alexandria, says a much graver evil has ramped up its way into the cities, the disease of effemination, men presenting as women. Mark how conspicuously they braid and adorn the hair of their heads. These are grievous vices in unmanliness and effeminacy. Rufus, a Stoic philosopher, this is about the same time Paul was writing. These are all first century people. He called hair a covering by nature. Remember, that's what he said. Paul's talking about by nature, a covering is hair. And objected to men, quote, cutting the hair to appear as women and seemed to be womenish, something that should be avoided at all costs. So what is Paul getting at? He's getting at exactly what we're talking about right now. Men should not present as women and vice versa. Now, does that mean that every single time, if we go out and we leave today and we see a man with long hair, we go, oh, there we go. You need to read 1 Corinthians 11. No. How about this? Did Samson have long hair? He sure did. Why did he have long hair? Because he was a Nazarite. And part of taking the Nazarite vow was not to cut your hair. Did John the Baptist have long hair? He was a Nazarite. So does that mean that John the Baptist is sinning because he's presenting as a woman? No, because it was culturally specific. So here in a culturally specific environment, men are not to present as women and women are not to present as men in this specific cultural environment is a way of erasing our gender and presenting otherwise than God has assigned us at birth. Are we together on understanding this? Now there's a piece of legislation in the U.S. Senate right now, just past the House, called the Equality Act. Now the Equality Act would put into legislation a lot of what we're talking about. Now, it's one thing, I want to show you a little bit about the Equality Act. The Equality Act would seek to amend two landmark civil rights laws, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act. So there, you're not allowed to discriminate according to sex. That'd be man, woman. But they're seeking to change it by expanding it. We see the same thing as with marriage. You know, oh, we're not changing it, we're just expanding it. No, 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 no. When you change it, you, when you expand it, you do change it. Instead of the term being solely in reference to biological men and women, it would also cover sexual orientation or gender identity. Now, it's one thing if someone comes uh, to you or to me, maybe somebody have a personal relationship and says, would you please refer to me with this pronoun? Now, I may or may not decide to do that. There'll be some times where maybe out of love and care for that person for a time, maybe I would. Understanding that truth needs to come in, but there, there's definitely specific circumstances. You might decide, no, I'm not going to do that because the circumstances say, I'm not going to do that. It's a whole other thing when it's legislated and there's a law that says you can be persecuted for not. That is another thing. And that we Christians should try to stand as much as we are able to and say, no. It's one thing if I have the freedom to or not and I have to make that decision on myself. It's a whole other thing when it's legislated. And some examples of where this could be problematic all sorts of ways. A teacher in Virginia was fired for failing to use a female student's preferred masculine pronouns, or a professor in Ohio was disciplined for not doing the same thing. This is increasingly a case in, in schools, uh, and a part of this legislation, as part of other legislation as well, uh, education in the United States would be mandated to teach these things to elementary school children. Homeless shelter for abused women in Alaska has been sued for refusing to admit a biological male. This is the issue when it comes to, okay, I'm going to decide tomorrow I'm going to identify as a woman so I can now use the woman's locker room. I'm going to now identify as a woman again, I guess, and I, now I want to participate in women's sports. Now I want to identify as a, a, this thing, and I, you can see this is all crazy. Illinois and California and Vermont foster parents are expected to provide children suffering from gender dysphoria 
with transition-affirming therapies over parents' medical or moral objections. These and other things, we need to be aware of how words are getting changed. Words are getting changed. And when you change words, you change the nature of reality. And as we said before, we're going to need to stand for these things, and we need to suffer for some of these things. And there, you know, there may be a time where it's going to be legislated, and I'm, we're just going to have to say, no, we won't do that. And we may get fined, we may get in trouble, but remember what Jesus said, your co-heirs with Christ provided you suffer with him in order that you may be glorified. One more category, and our final one, and that is the category of personhood, what it means to be a person. I would suggest to you that abortion, when you're dealing with, at least a suggestion, the deeper issues of abortion, yes, they're to do with life, but I think deeper it has to do with personhood. Personhood is the issue. I don't think anybody denies that what is there is alive. What they deny is, is it a person? That's where we need to really understand what's going on argument-wise, personhood. Now, we understand personhood, of course. We understand that what is conceived in the life of, uh, of the womb of a woman is a human being. As we read in Psalm 139, you knit me together uh, in my almost being in my mother's womb, and I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, yes. That, that's true, as a human being that's alive and growing inside the womb of a mother, which is a separate person. That's the key word, a separate person from the mother. And we root personhood biblically in the fact that we are made in God's image. That's where personhood must be rooted. If we root it other places, we get in trouble. It's rooted in being made in God's image. So we read again in Genesis 1, he makes us in his image. Male and female, he creates us. Now, there has been an assault on personhood in our culture, and when you change the definition of personhood and you divorce it away from what it means to be made in God's image, you can do all sorts of things. All sorts of things. I mean, in Nazi Germany, Jews weren't persons. What were they? Rats or cockroaches. Is it really wrong to kill a rat? Is it wrong to kill a cockroach? Well, if you can redefine a person as not being a person, then all of a sudden that's what that becomes. There's one person who's very explicit that he's doing that. He's from Australia, he's an ethicist, he's now at Princeton, but some of his ideas, which have a not too sort of a long history, are becoming more mainstream. His name's Peter Singer. Peter Singer is explicit on the fact that he is trying to redefine personhood. He's not playing around, and one thing you've got to give Peter Singer credit for is he's honest. He says, oh, yeah, a person is a human being. He says, yes, I know that the word person is in common use, and I know what I'm trying to do. I'm aware. I'm trying to shift it by suggesting that some humans might not be persons. Now, how do we define persons? Or how, I'm sorry, how does he define persons? Four things. And you've got to have these four things to be a person. One, you've got to be rational and self-conscious. Secondly, you've got to be a desiring and plan-making being. You've got to be able to see into the future and, and have a desire for the future, which is why you also have to desire to live. And then lastly, you must be autonomous, meaning you have the ability to make decisions and then act on them. So if you do not have these categories existent in yourself, you're not a person. So this is why infants in the womb are not persons. In fact, they're not persons for almost a month even after they're born. And there are disabled people who are also not persons and therefore not worthy of the protection of any kind of life. And he's real explicit. He says, look, killing them cannot be equated with killing normal human beings or any other self-conscious being. No infant, disabled or not, has, a strong, has as strong a claim to life as beings capable of seeing themselves as distinct entities existing over time. If a, if a parent says, my life would be happier if this baby wasn't born, that's what matters, because this is not a person. And they even may say, well, are you saying, Peter Sanger, that disabled people's life are not as worthwhile as normal people? He says, absolutely. It may be objected that to replace either a fetus or a newborn infant is wrong, because it suggests to disabled people living today that their lives are less worth living than the lives of people who are not disabled. Yet, it's surely flying in the face of reality to deny that. On average, yeah. Disabled people are not as worthwhile as normal people. I'm not Peter Singer, don't get mad at me. <laughs> 
This should highly, highly disturb us. It should highly disturb, it should highly disturb himself. I went, Peter, look at your words, brother. I mean, hello. You know, interestingly, I didn't say this in the last service, his mother is currently disabled. And guess what he's doing? Paying big bucks to keep her alive. Anyway, sorry, Peter, if you're watching. He's not consistent. He's very honest, but not consistent. Why are you keeping your mom alive? Because I want to. Well, she's not a person. I know. So what do these Christians we do? We need to be reminded of John chapter 17 yet again. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Where do we go to find truth? We find truth in the word of God. Each step along the way, we need to go, where are we rooting the definitions of reality? What does it mean for gender and sexuality? What does it mean for marriage? What does it mean for personhood? It must be rooted in the Bible. You must know your Bible or else you're going to be taken captive by philosophies and everything else. Don't be tossed to and fro by everything, that, every toss of the wind. The only way that's not going to happen is if you know your Bible. You know your Bible, and you're ready to stand for the truth of the Bible. And we have to recognize that increasingly this is going to be difficult for us as Christians. We said, that, look, the, the culture is shifting and changing. We need to be ready to stand. It's not always going to be very popular. 2015, Justice Alito, who was uh, one of the minority dissenters along with Chief Justice Roberts, said this, look, those who cling to the old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots. And we need to realize that's going to be true of us. We will be labeled bigots. Are you ready for that? If you're going to be an heir, a child of God, and a fellow heir with Christ, you can be a, you can be a co-heir with Christ, provided you suffer. And Christians need to enter into a greater understanding of a theology of suffering. And the church of the United States is beginning to enter in, beginning to enter in, what our brothers and sisters experience all around the world. We've been exempt for a time, but now we're beginning to enter in in greater measure to what Christians through time have all known. Jesus says this. There's no like, you know, they, you know, I'm surprised. Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say kinds of all evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And so as we close, let's close with just these thoughts. We've been talking a lot about truth. That always must be balanced with what? Love, grace, mercy. Right? It must always be balanced. We've talked a lot about truth today. It must always be balanced with love and mercy and grace. If someone was to come through these doors as a man dressed as a woman, let's say that happened today, what would we do? Would we chase him out and kick him on the way out and give each other a high five and, wow, we're really righteous here? Is that what we would do? Truth, but mercy. Jesus is our great example of truth and mercy. As a woman is brought before him, condemned, Jesus saying, he was without sin, be the first to cast a stone. Let's be reminded of our own sin today. Anybody who is struggling with these issues of homosexuality or gender identity or pro-choice, abortion-affirming people, they're sinners. But guess who else is a sinner? All of us. And Jesus died for our sins. Did he die for their sins too? They need Jesus is what they need. They need the gospel. We still stand for truth, but always balanced with mercy and grace. True. Yeah. As they say, there's a, a saying, someone sent it to me, I thought it was great. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. You can be all nice. We can be all nice and fuzzies, but it's like washing the deck of the Titanic when it's sinking. Hey, nice, the floor looks great. Well, we're all dead, you know. <laughs> truth and grace together. So let's strive, let's strive as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ with him as our example to stand for truth, to realize that when we do that, we will suffer. And to recognize that's kind of just par for the course. 
But let's do it in a way that demonstrates not just the truth of Christ, but the grace, love, and mercy of Jesus as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you were full of truth. You are truth. I am the truth. Full of grace and truth. Help us, Heavenly Father, in a culture that's so quickly moving and shifting and it's like a chameleon, changing colors. Help us to recognize. We pray our eyes wouldn't be blinded, like we're not seeing what's happening. Help us to see, have us eyes to see. And help us to be sanctified by the truth, knowing that your word is truth to be sent into the world as bearers of truth, to stand for the truth of marriage, to stand for the truth of gender in connection with biological sex, and to stand for the truth of personhood as we are all made in your image. And Lord, we pray that we would be ambassadors of reconciliation, that people hearing and seeing the gospel in our lives would be moved, and we would be the first to say, I am a beggar who needs bread. Let me show you where you can find some too. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.